Uh, Farhan, you had said that God doesn't need to be defined and has to be explicit if I understood you correctly. Is that what you said? I just want to make sure I understood your point. That's not my question. I want to know if you said that. Okay, so say it again. I God heard you say up here that God doesn't need to be defined in response to the fact that I was bringing up ambiguous, implicit testimony to the Trinity. And that doesn't suffice for you because when you're speaking of God, the language has to be explicit. So I understood your point correctly? The language has to be clear. Right. So that you don't need to define God. It will be clear. Yeah, it should be automatically clear without needing any interpretation. So I, I, I got my understood you. Right. I understand you're from a Salafi background. And uh, could you tell me, without defining, because you're not defined, well, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, I thought you were Salafi. What if you're not? If you're not, it's irrelevant because I understand your divisions. Okay, now the Quran often speaks of, of the face of Allah, the shin of Allah, the hands of Allah, Allah descends. And I know that the Muslims are debating amongst each other. Now, can you tell me what that means? And, well, well anyway. Sure, absolutely. And, but right. prove your position, don't just assume. Give me some evidence. Okay, absolutely. This has been debated amongst Muslims, um, whether God has actually hands or not, whether it's metaphorical or not. The primary two uh, perspectives are the Salafi perspective and the Sufi perspective. Uh, the Salafi believes uh, that when the Quran says certain things, it means it, and uh, it, but it doesn't mean, according to what the scholars I, I have learned under, that God has literal hands. Rather, if He has hands, but they're just not like our hands. The Sufi perspective is that they're metaphorical. To me, it's pretty much saying the same thing. That, that God is describing Himself with different attributes and different descriptions, and uh, whether you take it metaphorically or literally is pretty much up to you. Notice uh, that he had said that uh, when he's speaking of God, it needs to be explicit, it doesn't need to be defined. That's actually what he did say. And yet here we have a division of Muslims concerning the face, the hands, the shin of Allah. There's a group of Muslims that say they're metaphorical, others that say it's literal. Yet he said it's unlike anything in creation, but that's not saying anything. So no, he had to define his God for me. He had to tell me what it means and what it doesn't mean. So by his own criteria, his definition of God can't be true because it required an explanation. So you're being inconsistent again. Okay, so if in the Old Testament God has so many times and explicitly declared himself to be the God of Israel, the God of, the, the God of Moses, the God, God of Abraham, and so on and so forth. If God has explicitly defined himself as such, then why cannot God simply in the, the same exact manner, simply and unambiguously say that he is three persons, uh, one being? It doesn't, let me finish my question. The, 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 only, the issue isn't what, with the Qur'an. If you want to talk about the Qur'an, it's a different debate. If you want to talk, go ahead. Oh, you want me to answer? Okay. Uh, I don't know why God didn't come on and say it. Uh, it's like asking, why did God just come on and say I'm one being and one person? You know, in fact, I don't want you to use the word monotheism. I want you to start calling yourselves Unitarians. See, when you use that argument, it can be used more forcefully against you. See, again, so God doesn't say I'm one being in three persons, therefore it's ambiguous. But the same token, God doesn't say I'm one being in one person, therefore that's ambiguous, therefore we're back to square one. So then how do we determine the case? By looking at the evidence. Instead of putting God in a box and asking God to speak a certain way, let God speak freely and then let us look at the revelation of God to see in what way does God define His oneness? Is it a Unitarian conception? Or is it a plurality of divine persons that exist as one being? And again, I don't think you object to the use of, let's say, post-biblical language, because you use terms not found in the Quran, as long as those terms are faithful to what the Bible teaches. So although the Bible may not use being in distinction to person, these terms are faithful to the witness of Scripture. But again, I'm going to ask you to be consistent, because I can turn that against you and say, show me in the Bible, since you don't want to go to the Quran, and I accept your challenge to debate the Quran, show me the Bible where God says, hey Moses, I'm one being, one person. Because you know, I, I, I know all things, and I know those darn Trinitarians will be coming, in the future, they're going to be perverting my word. So Moses, let me ensure those Trinitarians don't get away with it. Right, one being, one person. See, that argument is nonsense, and it proves absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> Daniel 7, 9 to 10, I beheld to the thrones, and I want the people to hear the language, if I can just read the passages. Thrones, plural, were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of the head like the pure gold. His throne, singular, although there are many thrones, he only takes one. So I want you to pay attention to the text. Was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Okay, so it says, Ancient of Days sits on a throne, although there were thrones set up. Now, 13 and 14, same, same chapter. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him here before him. So he's not the Ancient of Days. Notice, the Son of Man is being brought to the Ancient of Days. So they're distinct. 
And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Serve him. The same Aramaic word used for worshiping God in Daniel 7, 27. You can check that out to see I'm not making this up. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that, uh, which shall not be destroyed. Here's an Old Testament text. You have the ancient days that won one throne and the Son of Man who was given eternal dominion. His dominion will never be destroyed. And it says everyone, not some, will serve him. The same Aramaic word Used in Daniel 7, 27, for serving the Most High, the Most High. Can you explain to me how is this how is this compatible with the monotheism that you say the Jews uphold? Because you said Jews and Muslims agree, they're monotheists. We agree on that. So that, in other words, they're monotheists the same way that you are. Can you explain how does this fit in your Islamic theology? Someone distinct from God, reigning forever, and being worshipped by all creatures. Can you explain how does that comport with your Islamic theology? This Old Testament text. I'll, what I was initially going to say, I'll say in my conclusion. Uh, but with reference to that, I mean, I don't see any description, that the, at least the ones that I would require to ask for, of, of three persons and somehow that this person is, these three persons are one being. I mean, you're talking about some uh, ancient of days and son of man being blessed for serving God. But I don't see how this contradicts Jewish Unitarianism or Muslim Unitarianism. Uh, well, I think we can see it clearly. You have two distinct persons, both of whom rule forever, both of whom are worshipped by every creature, and yet you're telling me the Jews are still Unitarians. Doesn't make sense to me. Ancient of days, distinct from the Son of Man, both of them rule forever, both of them have thrones they sit on, and both of them receive the same worship from every creature, and yet this is still Unitarianism. In other words, your position is, I made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. What evidence do you need uh, from, the, from the Hebrew tonight? Uh, that, that there is not a trinity, but there's a unity. What evidence would I require? Well, the evidence I'd require is not to find in the Old Testament passages such as the Son of Man. Son of Man, who's obviously a divine being, who appears in human form, because one like the Son of Man means someone who appears as a man, who receives exact worship that God receives forever. Now that's the kind of evidence I don't expect to find in the Old Testament with the prophets for human terms. I also don't expect to find the Holy Spirit being sent by God and accomplishing divine functions, such as creating, regenerating, sustaining, right? uh, saving, redeeming, and also being a speaking a being that he speaks and has emotions. So I don't expect to find that in your test if the prophets were Unitarians. And by the way, for the record, Rabbi Singer himself says the Holy Spirit is God. But like him, he thinks that the Spirit is not personally distinct, which is contrary to the Old Testament, unless you believe God was sending himself. I wouldn't expect to find the angel of Yahweh being called God by Hagar. I wouldn't expect to find Jacob praying to the angel to bless his children. I wouldn't expect to find the angel calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wouldn't expect to find Yahweh saying, my name is in him, and he can forgive sins. I wouldn't expect, him to, uh, expect to find the angel telling Israel, I brought you up out of the land. Uh, and I brought you into the land I swore to your fathers. And I swore I would break my covenant with you. I wouldn't expect to find... The parents of Samson saying when they saw the angel of God, they knew it was the angel of God, and then Manoah says, we will die for we have seen God. I wouldn't expect to find those kind of statements in the Old Testament. If Seder is right, the prophets were Unitarians. They're not, and he's wrong. Since you were appealing to authorities, and as I said, that would be the fallacy of authority unless you have some evidence to back up an authority. Let me quote to you a source. This comes from Jewish scholar Jacob Neusner. He's not a Christian, not a Trinitarian, unless he's a closet Christian, being paid by Trinitarians to say this to refute those opposed to the Trinity. Crying minds one another. But anyway, let me read what he says in the Mishnah and Messiah. We focus upon how the system laid out in the Mishnah takes up and disposes of those critical issues of te teleology worked out through messianic eschatology, the end time when Messiah comes. Now, these earlier systems resorted to the myth of the Messiah as Savior and Redeemer of Israel, a supernatural figure engaged in political historical tasks as king of the Jews, even a God-man. According to this Jewish scholar, there were certain Jewish denominations, to use your words, that believed the Messiah was a God-man. Why do you reject them, and why are they wrong? I mean, I have no idea what he meant by that. I would need to read it. I would need to read it in context to, to decipher. Now I would need to verify with, uh, with either himself or other rabbis what he meant, whether he's speaking in met metaphorical terms or or spiritual terms. I know I do know that rabbis do have an interpretation for what is meant for uh, mighty God in, in, in the Hebrew Tanakh, and uh, they have given, according to what the lectures that I've listened to, uh, a metaphorical definition of what that was meant, and where Elohim, what or Elohim was used throughout the New Testament. 
and talk, to talk about false gods, to talk about Moses being a god, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Um, my turn is fine. If you want the source, I'll give it to you. It's in my articles on the website. Judaism's and their messiahs at the turn of the Christian era. So he's talking about the Jew, various branches of Judaism around the time of Christ. It's edited by Jacob Neusner, uh, William Scott, and uh, Green and Ernest uh, as flights, page 275. So it's there. Uh, you said that you have to look into the quote to see because the Jews interpret passages metaphorically. The Jews you're referring to, as far as Isaiah 9 6 is concerned, are Jews who, in reaction to Christians using these passages, had to explain such passages away. Isaiah 9 6, when the child is called the mighty God, it is no more metaphorical than what Isaiah calls Yahweh the mighty God in the very exact, uh, next chapter. In Isaiah 10, 20, 21. If it's metaphorical here, consistency demands it's metaphorical there. But we Christians accept it for what it says, and this is why we're Trinitarians. My next question is, do you have any archaeological or, or historical evidence uh, that the that Jews from any generation, from, from the very outset, before Jesus ever appeared, that they defined God, or believe in God, or worship God as a triune being? Uh, well, the evidence I gave you is the Old Testament. Is that not proof enough? It's a historical document. It's the oldest document that we have uh, from the Jews, and clearly from Genesis all the way to Malachi. I didn't even give you uh, dozens of other verses that established the, the thesis that the, these Jews read the scriptures and they could clearly see the spirit is this thing from God. I even quoted sources. I quoted the Talmud. I just quoted uh, Neusner. I can also quote John J. Collins on his exegesis of Four Ezra and First Enoch. Four Ezra and First Enoch were books believed to be written right around the time of Christ. Some may even say maybe a little earlier. But they looked at these sources and they could tell that the Jews reading the Old Testament were not Unitarians. In fact, this is what's ironic. Muslims often like to use Philo, the Jew, Alexander the Jew, to prove that John was influenced by Philo. Who's Philo? Well, he was a Jew who lived before the time of Christ, who believed that the Word of God was distinct from God and was God in essence, and he was the high priest, the chief of angels, the intercessor. So here's a Jew, long before Paul, who introduced the Trinitarianism, according to the statements he made, saying that in heaven there is someone distinct from God called the Logos, the Word. He is God. He calls him a second God. But in his theology, second God doesn't mean two gods. Read it. You'll see. That's the theology he uses to affirm that the Logos is distinct from God and yet fully divine. And even says he's not created and he's not uncreated. It sure sounds like the church fathers when it says that Jesus is eternally begotten. So here you can see from the scriptures that there's some other divine being who's in heaven sitting on the throne long before Jesus. And yet when that is quoted, you say, aha, John plagiarized Philo. So in other words, you know, damn if we do, damn if we don't. If we show that John is faithful to the Jews before him, he plagiarized. But then again, if you're asking me to show you sources to demonstrate that the witness of the New Testament is faithful with what the, some of the Jews believe in the Old Testament, I gave you Philo. I can give you the wisdom of Sirach. I can give you various sources. First Enoch, for Ezra, and the Old Testament. If that's not good enough, then nothing will suffice. Since you, you're saying that the evidence I gave from the Old Testament was <coughs> implicit, and I deny that assertion, I think it's quite explicit. It was also explicit to these Jews who I quoted. They could see clearly that the Spirit was distinct from God, and yet happened to be God. The angel was distinct from God, and yet he was fully divine. Be that as it may, uh, as a Muslim, I want to know, are you comfortable with Jacob praying to the angel? Genesis 48, verses 15 to 16. Here's an angel, Jacob prays him, and you believe he's a Muslim. Are you comfortable with the fact that Jacob prayed to this angel? And at the same time, are you comfortable with the fact as a Muslim, and you can say with a clear face, because it's being recorded, oh yeah, that comports with Unitarianism. It comports with Islamic monotheism. The fact that the same angel tells Jacob, I am the God of the house of God. That's equivalent to Gabriel saying, I am the God of the Kaaba. Are you comfortable with those statements? Statements where the angel is worshipped, he's praying to Genesis 48, 15, 16. You kept saying, well, you know, we don't find any evidence that they worship three persons of God. Well, in Genesis 48, 15 to 16, Jacob is praying to the angel and asking him specifically to bless his grandchildren. Another place, the angel says he's God and he forgives sins. Are you comfortable with these statements as a Unitarian? The context is Jacob's about to bless his grandchildren. Let's read it. And then Israel said, stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands uh, wittingly for Manasseh was the first one. And he blessed Joseph, blessed him, and said, God, before whom my father is Abraham, and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto his day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lads. As I noted in my uh, rebuttals, 
the verb bless is singular, although he mentions God and the angel. And it's clearly a prayer to God to bless them. Are you comfortable with Jacob praying to the angel to bless his grandchildren? How does that comport with Islamic Unitarianism? We Muslims believe that angels are blessings, and angels are sent down to humanity as blessings, and that they provide spiritual, uh, they, they provide a spiritual uplifting and, and, and help the person become more spiritually inclined toward God. Uh, I don't see that the person is uh, actually invoking the angel to provide him with anything particularly. But uh, since I am not a scholar of the Old Testament, as I said in my opening statement, uh, I reserve the right to go study the verse and uh, maybe go and ask Rabbi Zayn. Okay, give me his number so I can talk to him too. Uh, in Genesis 48, he says that he has no problem and he has to study the Bible. Fine, I would like you to study it by the grace of Jesus. Open your heart to the truth. Uh, but in the context there, he's praying to God. He goes, God, clearly no one would argue he's praying. God, the God, and yet he mentions the angel. You said that pretty much, well, it, it's not problematic. So then that means you could stand before the Muslims here and cry out to Jibreel. Oh, Jibreel. Bless my family. O Jibreel, save me from my enemies. O Jibreel, may Jibreel bless you. May Jibreel protect you. You're saying you're okay with that. And yet you said you're a Unitarian.